You have found Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumphant successes of business owners across the land. Past episodes of the Authentic Business Adventures program can be found in the podcast link at drawincustomers.com. We are underwritten locally by the Bank of Sun Prairie. My name is James Kademan, entrepreneur, author, speaker, and helpful coach to small business owners across the country. Today, we're welcoming slash preparing to learn from Trisha, the president of Ritual Foundry, as well as Brad, the founder. So welcome, you guys. Thanks. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for having us. This is a, this is a cool space, and I'm excited to yeah. learn exactly what you do. Because when I met you and we started talking, the 3D printing world is pretty cool, mm -hmm. but I always knew it as plastic. Yep. When you mentioned metal 3D printing, just mind blown moment there. Yeah, and what's super awesome about what we're doing here is you're taking that plastic 3D printing that mm -hmm. you're familiar with, yeah. using that same 3D printer, but now you're printing metal with our materials. That's cool, so same exact printer? Yes. Wow, so tell us, you guys supply the materials or just tell us more or less what you guys do? Yep. We're, we're a materials company only. Okay. We supply other things in our store, like we'll sell printers and things that you need to go along with it, but mm -hmm. just to make it easier for our customers. Our prime objective is to make 3D printing materials. All right. So what are people, is it typically businesses or is it typical just people out of their house that are buying the stuff? It's really everybody. Okay. So a lot of universities and colleges mm -hmm. and schools all over the world. Oh, wow. Research organizations, the Department of Defense. Okay. Um, people Everyone. at home. All right. And industry. Okay. About three quarters of the national labs, there's 17 of them, and we count at least over a dozen of them as customers. Wow. In the metal, I see a lot of spools there. I imagine there's yep. different varieties. Yes. Yep. Are we talking steel, aluminum? Like what, what is the range that you guys have for metals? Right. Well, the everything about this is patented, and the patent describes a method of manu fabricating, manufacturing, 3D printing, metal, glass, and ceramic. Wow. So it runs the spectrum. So you can actually use this technique to print glass parts and ceramic parts. Really? Not just metal. How does that work? Um, <laughs> like glass, I'm trying to picture. Right. Okay, how does that work? The easiest analogy is pottery. Everybody's worked with clay and mm -hmm. things like that. That is essentially very similar to the process that we do here, except we 3D print it rather than form it on a potter's wheel or something okay. like that. Okay. So are you, I imagine the, f what they call it, the filament? The element? Filament. filament. Yep. The filament. That has to get hot enough to melt. Correct. The medium, right? Yep. Oh my gosh, my nomenclature, I'm way out here. <laughs> <laughs> Trisha has a good, good experience. Yeah, the for this. filament is made of powdered metal encased in regular 3D printing plastic. Oh. So when you're printing, that's why it works on a regular 3D printer. Because gotcha. you're melting the plastic as All it right. goes through, but not the metal. All right. So does the plastic itself work as a binder for yes, the metal? Yes, that's gotcha. exactly it. That's Got it. That's what okay. we call it. So are the parts, like if I were to print out a threaded part, would the threads on there be strong enough to hold? I don't know what a normal metal piece would, would it be? Just off the printer it would not, because okay. it still has that plastic in it. Gotcha. But there's a secondary process that you can go through oh. to get rid of that plastic and fuse those metal particles together. That's called debinding. Okay. To get that binder out. All right. And then sintering is that process of fusing those particles together. All right. Then in that case, that's where the strength of metal comes into play. Nice. And All this right. Is, this is where the analogy works well with clay. Okay. It's the same kind of thing. You form it and then you put it in a kiln and fire it. A, okay, got it. Got it. So is that something that people from home have equipment to do that? We have, lots uh, of we have, yeah, we have lots of home users. Wow. It, it runs the gamut. I mean, we have everybody from that's, you know, just people making things in their basement to uh, in part of the maker movement, mm -hmm. uh, people are calling it. So it's just a new method of letting people fabricate parts in a low cost. All right. Simple way. All right. That's cool. Now you asked about what different materials. Yeah. We do keep a standard stock that's going to include things like copper, bronze, a few different varieties of steel, tungsten, wow. aluminum, titanium. Okay. And then so we get into ceramics and then a Pyrex glass material. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah how does that work? But we, uh, it's the same. It's okay. powdered glass in this plastic binder. So sure. our manufacturing process is the same among all the materials. Okay. Which allows us then to be able to take nearly any metal, any ceramic, any glass, put it through the same process that we yeah. have developed here. Okay. And now you're 3D printing with it. All right. When I think of Pyrex, I think of something very durable. 
and very resistant to heat. Yeah. So does that challenge when people have to bake it essentially? No, it still has the same properties. The difference is it's not clear. When okay. we say glass, people tend to picture clear mm -hmm. glass. It's mm -hmm. not clear. Okay. But it is Pyrex and it has all the same properties as far as dealing with thermal shock and that kind of thing. Yeah, and so they can make their own beakers or measuring cups or whatever? Yeah, or um, like uh, high performance glass filters okay. that people use. Wow, use for. that's cool. So how did this whole thing come about? Uh, this was, I was dabbling in my basement and this started, this part of the project started in about 2014. But I'd actually been experimenting with methods of making metal objects that didn't use large amounts of heat. So that was where the virtual foundry concept mm -hmm. came from. So I've actually been using the word for over 15 years, probably closer to 20 by now. All right. So the virtual foundry as a term has been around forever. Um, when uh, a friend of mine gave me a 3D printer, just said, you got to try this. So I, I got it up and running. Uh, the first thing I printed was a piece of plastic, which was very disappointing. Because oh. <laughs> it, it's plastic and it felt like a toy or a Happy Meal toy. So. Mm -hmm. um, and then that was where I saw an opportunity to combine all the things that I was working on with using 3D printing as a method of creating the form for those objects. All right. Interesting. And how long ago was this? We're talking 15 years? Uh, 2014 is when okay. I started. That's when I added 3D printing to the other parts of the technology that I was working on. Gotcha. All right. So did the business itself come about at that moment? Or when did you decide, <coughs> hey, let's make this into a business? Well, it started to make sense early on. And uh, I did a Kickstarter project. And we hit about, I think, 103 or 105% of our goal. So we made it past that. That financed us into this room, into this building. All right. And financed our commercial extrusion equipment. Wow. That's super cool. And how long ago was that? That was 2015, 2016. Oh, so it was pretty fast. Just a year or two after you figured mm -hmm. the whole thing yeah. out. Yeah. All right. And did the, the patents, are they your patents? Yes. Wow. Those patents take time, don't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I've never gotten a patent, but I have talk to people that have gotten them and it was never like, oh, it's an easy process. Right. Well, when I, when I realized that this could be done, I immediately understood that it could be very important. Patent was priority one. Uh, All right. In fact, a huge amounts of our early money went into financing the patent. Oh, interesting. And it, All was, right. and it was a very arduous process. Okay. Do you know what year it was granted? I think in August of 19. Oh, wow. Okay. It was, um, okay. Officially official. Right. Right. All right. And I'm pretty sure we filed it in 2016. Maybe, so maybe 2015. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Wow. And is that you have to get an attorney and run through mm -hmm. all kinds of hoops and stuff yeah. like that? If you, if you want to do it right, it's not something you want to DIY. Okay. So, we, right. so uh, I didn't want to risk coming up with a patent that wasn't enforceable. So yeah, we hired a, a very high-end law firm that we have a lot of faith in. All right. Very cool. So something like a patent, I guess, going down that road just a little bit. How long does that last? Is that is that the seventy year thing uh, or something like that? Twenty years, I think it is at this point. Twenty years, okay. Right. So yeah, we were just talking about this. We're already five years into our twenty year. patent. So they started right? from application point, not uh, the time that's actually given we're to. We're not exactly sure, actually. Oh. Something I could, I <laughs> okay. Need to follow up on. But, All right. Well, I'm but yeah, we know it lasts twenty years, but we're not sure when it starts. All right. Fair. Very fair. So how did you market this to people? So you got this cool thing, it's patented, nobody else has it. How do you tell the world that you have it? This was a key challenge, especially starting up. The, the Kickstarter campaign itself turned into an excellent form of marketing. Mm. I was able to get the attention of um, so engineers at Lockheed Martin, things like that. There are people that looked at it and immediately understood it. Most people look at what we're doing and either don't understand what it is, they don't understand why it's important, and from there. Mm -hmm. So we've gone through a series of <coughs> phases where initially people, like I would show people parts and they would say that, no, I don't think you made it that way. You know, oh, they, were in they wouldn't believe you? <laughs> so that, I mean, they didn't come out and say that, but that, but <coughs> but that was the general implication. So. It, it was so difficult to pe get people to understand that, looking back, it's kind of, I'm surprised. It took a lot of tenacity to stick with it. Oh, sure. And this is where Trisha came in. Mm -hmm. When Trisha joined the company, 
it was pretty much just a nerd and some friends in a garage. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, but Sounds she, like a good band, right? <laughs> right. So adding Trisha to the mix added legitimacy to the business side of things. Got our billing functioning properly. Got all that kind of stuff working. Mm -hmm. And got all that to make sense. Um, but early on, <clears throat> the inspiration came from the early adopters. So as an example, um, a group of engineers at Lockheed Martin invited me out to speak at a conference for their engineers. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, this was, this is like, uh, uh, you know, a nerd highlight. Right. I, uh, I got a chance to speak in the Hubble Auditorium to uh, hundreds of Lockheed Martin engineers. And the person that introduced me, introduced me as the person that's found the holy grail of metal 3D printing. Wow. So this was very inspirational. Yeah. And it got me through a lot of low times. All right. So the people well, that's that, pretty cool. So the people that got it, got it. Mm -hmm. The rest of the people either didn't understand it, didn't think it was important, et cetera. And, and that was kind of where we segue into trying to deal with investors and people like that. Mm. The investors didn't get it. Uh, banks didn't get it. Nobody got it. I, you know, it's interesting. <laughs> I've interviewed a lot of people. and. I feel like, and just, I guess, looking around business-wise, I feel like the people that are doing stuff with hardware, tangible stuff, have a harder time finding investors than the people with the software, intangible stuff. Yes. Right. Even when the software people have no defined means to bring in revenue. Right. It blows my mind. Yeah, we've seen it repeatedly. Yeah. And especially, I'm like, these are people that have extra cash to throw around at a gamble. Yeah. And when you hear somebody talk and they say, oh, you know, we had a $5 million investment in A series, B series, blah, blah, blah. And you ask a question like, how do you make money? I'm like, oh, we'll figure that out later. <coughs> that seemed to be one of those like, wait, shouldn't you figure that out in the beginning? Yeah. Uh, Trisha and I, I think we spent a couple of years probably mm -hmm. interacting with the general investment community we did. Yeah. We did accelerators. We did everything that you can think of when we talked to a lot of people. And there are two reasons we didn't, there are multiple reasons we didn't go that way. One, we really didn't find a situation that felt comfortable for us. Mm. And two, they just they didn't understand. And the people that were into venture capital, they would tell us, they would say that you know 80 80 percent of my investments are going to fail. So the 20 percent that succeed have to be giant winners. Yeah. And you know we that didn't make sense to us. No. Why are you making those bad investments? Right. <laughs> and, uh, and and why do we have to support your failures? Right. <laughs> so. so Oh, that's funny. Right. So, so what they're essentially saying is you're going to win, you're just not going to win huge. I'm investing in all these right. mistakes that I know are mistakes. Right. Or that are probably mistakes. They were looking for the big win. Yeah, interesting. Which is tough to make when it's tangible. Yeah. Because it's tangible, right? Software you can duplicate infinitely. Well, well scalability is always an issue if yeah. you're manufacturing a product. Mm -hmm. You know, it's difficult to expand manufacturing. Right. So. Interesting. So, did you guys know each other before? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how did you get involved in this? Well, Brad and I have known each other for probably 10 years before okay. I got involved in the company. Yeah. Um, just, we both live mm -hmm. in Stoughton here. Okay. Um, we were in the same social circle. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I've, and I've been friends with his wife for quite a while. All right. She would talk about what he was up to. Okay. And I knew that it was special. All right. And I wanted to be a part of it. Mm -hmm. But how do you, how do you finagle yourself into a ground floor <laughs> technology startup? Um, so I said, hey, you know, when he's ready for a business person, yeah, you know, elbow him uh, much right. in my way. Um, and then uh, that worked. I don't know. All right. I don't know if it was her doing that really uh, pushed him, or if he made the decision himself. But he invited me to All right. come and talk. I, I made the decision myself. I knew I knew that you were right for the job, but I probably wouldn't have well, pursued you in the way that I did if it weren't for Laurie pointing out the. Actually, bluntly, Laurie just said, "Trisha wants in." <laughs> <laughs> okay. I did want in. <laughs> That's awesome. So when we. When Brad asked me to come and meet mm -hmm. to talk about uh, my taking the president role, he um, said, "Is it okay with you?" He said he it felt like he was proposing to me, "Would oh, you sure. be my president?" Now he was not down on one knee or anything, right. but I still accepted the role. Well, still a relationship. Yes. 
Just like any other relationship, so sure. And, and it took a lot of trust. So he was trusting me with this um, invention mm -hmm. um, to really take it somewhere. Well, yeah. Asking someone into a multi-year equipment, multi-year commitment is no small request. Right. Yeah. So at that time, was it you or did you have employees? It was just me and a couple people helping me here and there. Okay. Company. Gotcha. <laughs> All right. So was the leap more or less to bring Trisha on because you needed more business acumen or to sell or but to figure out what you were missing? Uh, structure. Structure. Okay. Yeah. So, right. Definitely the business part of it, but two things. Trisha's ability to learn new things quickly. Mm -hmm. That was kind of an important part. And a known willingness to change her mind when she decides she's wrong. Oh, all right. I, I, I consider that an important factor. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so mostly bringing structure to the business. That okay. Is, that is not my thing. My thing is... <laughs> <laughs> my, my thing is making things that haven't been made before. All right. Just shoot from the hip, go, we have a yeah. product. Yeah. We'll figure out how to sell it later. Yeah. yeah. Kind of thing, or ever, maybe. <laughs> yeah, right. Interesting. So how do you sell most of what you have? Is it online? Do people come in? Is it a retail? Uh, we have an online store. Okay. And then uh, we have a distributor in Spain. Oh, wow. Okay, this is worldwide. Yeah, oh, oh yeah. absolutely. Nice, yes. uh, okay. We have a distributor in Spain and we've just onboarded a new reseller in Canada. Oh, nice, yeah. okay. So those are our outlets right now. So mm -hmm. in the US, it's us. All right. And then Europe and Canada, but um, you know, people buy from us from all over the world. It's, Pretty wow. fun. That's cool. One of my favorite parts of my work is talking with people from all over the world. So right. I can have a day where I meet with somebody from Taiwan in the morning and somebody from Brazil in the afternoon, and uh, I love it. Wow, is language barrier an issue? Uh, sometimes we just, if it is, we just go a little more slowly. But okay. uh, thankfully for me, um, English is the universal business language. So mm -hmm. most people speak English. Um, if not well enough to speak, at least well enough to write, and we okay. can get our messages back and forth. Nice. Yeah. That's super cool. So you're marketing essentially global. How do you tell the world that you have this cool thing? It's incredibly challenging. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think likely our most effective marketing is word of mouth. Okay. Uh, a scientist here will tell a scientist friend at a conference, mm -hmm. you know, take a look at this. All right. And that's likely where most of our traction has come from. Okay. We still have sort of the residuals from the initial, the original Kickstarter people. We still mm -hmm. have a core group of home users that are very dedicated. All right. And, and are committed to bringing the technology forward. Because mm -hmm. the other part of the thing is we make 14 different materials that we stock regularly. Mm -hmm. That's 14 different, very specific processes that need to be developed mm -hmm. to refine into a high quality part. Mm -hmm. So our users tend to contribute a lot to the, the scientific development oh. of the materials. All right. It would be impossible for us to do all of it ourselves. Right. Yeah. Because, we're, because we're bootstrapping. Right. Interesting. Now, search engine optimization has been really critical, too, because okay. people are looking for metal 3D printing. They so are? we're okay. past the point now where we're, we're far past the disbelief point. Um, it's very well accepted that this is a real thing that exists, and now people want it. They mm -hmm. recognize that they need to participate yeah. in this if they're going to stay relevant, because 3D printing is absolutely not going away. No. Uh, conversely, it's going to get even more prolific mm -hmm. as time goes, until the point where everyone has a 3D printer at home as just as they do a computer. You expect that to happen? Yes. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> so I think you and I were chatting before. I had that printer repair thing. I guess, would that be 2D printing? On paper? Yeah, I don't, yeah, we have to... <laughs> <laughs> 1D? I don't know. Whatever it is. The kind that jam a lot. I had that business for eight years, and I was trying to figure out the next step. And that was, I don't know, uh, six years ago that I sold that, roughly. Um, so I was trying to, like, 3D printers were kind of coming around then. Mm -hmm. The the maker bots of the world were around. And I was thinking, this would be really cool if people had that. Yeah. But then I thought, um, people have a hard time loading their paper tray. <laughs> yeah. Or they don't, there's just little stuff like that that I'm like, Ugh, is that going to be a thing? 
But then there's the practicality of it. You need a part. Yeah. Pump yeah. out a part. Yes. It can be starting out can be very challenging in 3D printing, not just with metal 3D printing, just mm -hmm. with 3D printing in general. Yeah. It can, it can be mm -hmm. aggravating to get going. That's why largely like the home users are still kind of hobbyists. They're still people that are willing to overcome an annoying problem. Yeah. They're not people that stop just because something didn't work quite right. Right. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, the, the scientists and the people in the industry get a chance to do something that's never been done before. Mm -hmm. So they have a different motivation to focus on improving our products. Gotcha. So let's talk about the metals, because I'm curious about that. You mentioned, I think you said 14 different yep. types of products. Well, if I'm an engineer and I'm looking at building, let's say, a hinge for a wing or something like that, I don't know. Are they aiming for a specific grade of aluminum or something of that nature? Or is this more or less just to see if it can physically work and then they use a CNC mill or something like that to produce? Like, what is the everything engineering? That, everything that you just said happens. Okay. All right. So it's, all, it's more or less up to the engineer to figure out right. so how to take it from an idea. Right. So we, we have aluminum and an alloy called 6061. Okay. It's, yep. it's the most common. Yep. But we will make other uh, we'll make other alloys for people. Also. Okay. And one thing we haven't talked much about is the custom materials aspect of it. Yeah. Uh, we this is becoming increasingly common where someone will call us up and say, "Hey, can you make uh, this grade of magnesium for us into a 3D printing filament?" Wow. And we've shipped these all over the world. We've done it for National Labs. We've done it for the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. And that one was kind of cool because they couldn't tell us exactly what it was, but they promised it wasn't <laughs> harmful. <laughs> All right. Anyway, but now the money's green. <laughs> <laughs> what's running on the printer behind us here yeah. is a custom iron for a university. Oh, wow. Iron. Yeah. All right. So is it, So I don't know much about the actual mechanics of a 3D printer. I know you got XYZ axes, but the... There must be some type of a melting it, filament in there. It's a hot glue gun on a robot. So do, can they adjust the temperature? Yes. So I imagine for each spool of different material, they have to adjust the temperature differently? A little bit. Most of ours run in roughly the same oh, they do? Okay. temperature band. You're only melting that plastic that holds it together. All right. You're not, it isn't dependent upon whatever the, uh, the composite gotcha. is. Gotcha. Okay. Is there a certain percentage of binder versus metal? Yes. Okay. So, in, right, and that's very specific to our recipe, and that's part of the challenge over the past few years, developing <coughs> a polymer recipe that was strong enough to hold that shape of the filament, but have enough metal in it that will center into a, a, a good quality object. At yeah. The end. So it's, yeah. it's been a back and forth. Okay. I mean, everything's a compromise, but you got to yep. do your best. But over time, right, I've gotten better with uh, polymers and that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. so I'd improve the polymer. We'd add more metal in, and get more brittle, and all right. Like that. Oh, so right, gotcha. So we're at the sweet spot right now. All right. We can make a uh, very strong filament with a high enough loading that it that it's very effective in the sintering process. Nice. I imagine. I guess I'm just guessing here, but the metal must have to be pretty fine. It within is. that filament so it doesn't clog up anything, right? Yeah. It's a powder. Okay. It, yeah. It's powdered metal. And, okay. And the underlying science for the whole concept, everything that we've talked about and everything we do is called yeah. powder metallurgy. Okay. And that in itself is a rapidly growing industry, even outside of additive manufacturing. Oh, really? <coughs> yeah. All right. Powder metallurgy is also very old. Mm-hmm. Okay. So uh, precious metal clay is very similar to what we're doing, just as Brad was talking about clay earlier. Okay. That's been around forever. Precious metal, would it, you have precious, to help me with that. Oh, precious metal clay is clay with metal in it. Okay. Similar to our filaments. Yeah. You're doing the same thing. You're forming it into a shape. Okay. And then you're doing a heat process to it to get, now this is where my knowledge of the knowledge of it stops. Right. Well, it's the same, right? You're doing a heat process it's exactly to it the and same. the clay goes but away. And, the precious yeah. metal clay, you can form it like clay, but, yeah. it, but it's silver. And, okay. And when you're done, you'll hit it with a torch or heat it up and it burns off the binder and all you're left with is the silver. So the clay actually burns away? Yeah, it's actually, it's not clay, it's actually rice flour. Oh, so, <laughs> gotcha, So okay. it's that simple. All right. So it's powdered metal mixed with rice flour. And, yeah. And people make these fantastic jewelry objects and things like that. Really? And then are they forming by hand, essentially? Yeah, and you can form it by hand, you can extrude it, roll it, whatever you can think of. So you just 
plane of Play-Doh, any, essentially. Yeah, or any shape like you that. can make it into becomes yeah. a metal object. All right. And this is very much an extension of that. Any way that you can get our material into a shape, mm -hmm. it will be that metal object at the end. Oh, that's pretty so cool. So it includes not just 3D printers, but you can get these 3D pens and things like that. Uh, some pe so you can freehand metal, which, wow. is, which is pretty unique. All right. And you can form it with, you know, um, a, uh, uh, a soldering iron and stick. However you can create a shape, you oh, can yeah. make it into the metal object. All right. Or you can take little pieces of this and put it in an injection molding machine. All right. Uh, and create your metal object that way. Gotcha. Just like you would with plastic. But instead, right. you end up with something that's metal. Yeah. So we're putting it into filament form to mm -hmm. enable 3D printing. Mm -hmm. But this material, it doesn't matter how you form it. All right. The, the you're going to get it into a shape somehow. Yeah. And then you're going to do the heat process where you debind and center. Gotcha. Yeah, and we were gathering momentum on injecting this with a plastics injection molding machine, and that was right about when COVID hit. And okay. That, kind of knocked that project off. Line. I keep hearing that phrase. Yeah, yeah. Right that's about when COVID hit. <laughs> <laughs> right. It just changes the world a little bit. Yeah, one of our, one of our project leaders on that lost a family member, and so it just kind of oh, knocked gotcha. the project off. Wow, all right. Sorry about that. Yeah. So tell me, just so that people that don't know necessarily, 3D printer we have going back here. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to do it yourself or what do I have to throw at money-wise to get started into something like this? The absolute least costly, you can buy this base machine for $650. Oh, all right. You, if you want to completely lowball, this is the Ender 5 by Creality, and this is the one we recommend for our users. Okay. You go down to the Creality 3, and you can, you can be printing metal parts for about $350. Really? Yeah. Okay. And all right. This is another challenge we've had. When we say 3D metal printing, everyone thinks that it has something that we've invented a printer or something like that. Oh, sure. So this is something that we are very explicit about. It mm -hmm. isn't about the printer. Yeah. We're about the materials. Right. The printing technology is its own thing, and it's improving over time. Yeah. And as that technology improves, it just kind of brings our material with it. Gotcha. So the, thr the printer is not the important part. So, you know, it's interesting you say that, because when Trisha first mentioned what she was doing, I was trying to picture, I was just picturing this oxyacetylene <laughs> printer mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Like, How does that work? Right. Okay. So it's interesting that you say that. That's cool. Right. It's simplicity. That was, mm -hmm. that's, this yeah. is a very kind of gentle form of metal 3D printing. Yeah. There are other technologies that exist that have beds of metal powder and lasers or kind of what you imagine mm -hmm. probably exists also yeah. as a metal printing technology. Mm -hmm. So 3D printing and additive manufacturing are synonymous. Yeah. There are lots of different technologies that fall under that umbrella, mm -hmm. including with metal 3D printing. Mm -hmm. This is the um, most accessible. Right because you're working with the equipment that you already know. Right. You're using a standard tabletop kiln mm -hmm. to do that heat process. So uh, you're not getting into any kind of safety danger zone. Gotcha, no crazy sparks flying or anything right. like that. And you have control over every part of the process. Okay, nice. Right, and we're the only option that's under about $250,000. So there's just, there's <laughs> a quarter million dollars. Yeah. And it, wow, it, it, okay. It sounds, well. <laughs> so we're actually working on fleshing it out a little bit so we cover some more bases All right. in between where we are and the 200 Yeah, like you're just talking about a few hundred bucks, less than right. a grand, whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, yeah, and this brings up it, uh, one of our challenges to marketing is, is that the cost is so low that managers find it suspicious. Oh, the value's in the price, right? Yeah. yeah. You're so, telling me, wait, 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 wait. I meant to $180,000, right. not 600 Right, yeah. so, right. I, I said to something, like, at our last trade show, somebody asked what that cost, and I said 300 He goes, and he looked puzzled and said, 300 what? <laughs> <laughs> he, he was expecting 300000 but yeah. that's not where it is. And we had another group come by with, so this was a... Uh, he was a professor at Harvard, okay. and they were pricing out, putting in a 3D metal printing solution, and everything that they came up with, none of it was under 250000 mm -hmm. and, and then there was us at more like the $10,000 range, and we got to try to spend that much. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, he said, how can we get this up more in the fifty to $60,000 range so that I can get my managers to, to buy this? Oh, buy mm -hmm. more of them. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that person is just helping us flesh out larger packages. Gotcha. All right. That we'll make available. What an interesting problem. Yes. Right? Can you make this more expensive? That's probably not something that any business owner typically hears. <laughs> right. would love to hear. Right. That's funny. So when it comes to something like this, do you typically see businesses having rows of these things? Yeah. Or they just have one or two? And that is starting to become the case. Okay. Right. With, that's called a print farm. Is it a row? Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. awesome. Okay. Yeah, when you've got a row of this style of 3D printer, it's right. FDM or FFF. Okay. Just fused deposition modeling or fused okay. filament fabrication. Wow, okay. Those two are synonymous also. Some people also call 3D printing um, free, fused freeform fabrication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're just making a um, backer name. Yeah. We, okay. Well, it's, yeah. it's a brand new technology, so we get to make, we get to name everything. Got it. Um, and that's what people are, they're coming up with complicated names. Mm -hmm. um, but at any rate, yes, you can have multiples of the style of 3D printer yeah. and just crank parts out. Nice. So this style of 3D printing isn't going to give you a production level. Okay. Um, it, someday. Sure. It will. So people ac accommodate for that, but it's such a low cost solution. Mm -hmm. So they make up for that by just having many of them going at the same time. Got it. So are they, so I guess just to clarify, they're not printing out necessarily usable gears or are they? Well, well, let's talk about what this is, yeah, where this totally. fits well. So the final parts, because we're starting with metal powder, these little balls, and they the edges of the balls get fused together in that sintering process, there is some space in there. So it's not solid metal when you're done. Right. It's very close to solid metal. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not going to, it will have the same properties as the metal that it is. Mm -hmm. It just isn't going to be solid. Gotcha. 100%. So not as strong as some uh, chunk of aluminum that was CNC machine, right? Or something like that. So you're not going to use this to make parts that are going to be structural in nature. They're okay. going to have to take a lot of sure. weights and things like that. Okay. But they're going to be awesome at acting as filters and um, pieces on the outside. Mm -hmm. And I've, I'm, you can name so many more than me. Right. Well. I'll back up a little bit actually. So one of the other challenges is when we tell people you can 3D print metal, their first thought is, oh, I'll print a trailer hitch. Yeah. Oh, anyway. gotcha, okay. So part of what Trisha and I are on now is more like a, uh, a, a an education tour where we're mm -hmm. telling people, you know, don't think of it that way. All those parts, like all the parts in your car are not only designed to solve whatever problem it is for the car, they're also designed to be manufactured on a mill or a lathe mm -hmm. or cast. Mm -hmm. So we're asking people to back up a little bit and rethink it. Okay. So if you take a little bit different approach to how the parts are made, mm -hmm. you can make them much less complex, mm -hmm. you can use far less material, uh, those kind of things. And there's a new technology coming along. Um, Generative design, right? G generative design and or topological topological optimization, right. which I find <coughs> very fun to say. Yeah, that sounds like something that a business coach would say. <laughs> topological optimization, yes. like whoa, take my money. Right. So <laughs> if you picture a CAD program, normally you would draw boxes and mm -hmm. draw holes and things like that. And this is coming from the top. This is the leaders in this technology is Autodesk, like as in AutoCAD. Yep. They own this segment yeah but in generative design instead you tell it you need support for 100 pounds here you need support for 50 pounds here just to have torsion on it from this angle mm -hmm. go and it will grow it like a tree and they and the parts come out with these really unique shapes all right you'll start to see them now that i've mentioned it they, okay they're mechanical parts with a very organic look to them Really? But they're absolutely perfect for our technology. All right. So this is where we're trying to steer people. Got it. Get away from replacing the milling uh, concepts. Rethink it. Okay. Interesting. So I imagine, I'm just trying to picture this. In the case of a trailer hitch, let's say, mm -hmm. they're making it thicker, I imagine, on the front and the rear than the sides, I imagine, or something like that, or where the ball actually, where it goes around the ball, it has to be right. tougher. 
where the bolts go through onto the trailer yeah. has to be thicker or something like that? Um, I have pictures that I'll share with you. Okay. Maybe, maybe you can post them. Uh, sure. Uh, yeah. During the video. Yeah. And it'll help it make sense. And is the the program itself is coming up with these shapes? It is. So there's not an engineer that's going through and designing this. Right. No. They're right. just saying this is what we need from this part, and the computer or right. the program pumps out. This is your result. Exactly. And that's the other really interesting thing about the technology is it's taking the skill out of the engineering. Uh -huh. It's a technician that's entering data, All right. so saying this is the properties that we need. Yeah. The person operating the computer doesn't need to understand stress forces and metallurgy and that kind of thing. You know, that's kind of scary to hear because every time <laughs> I watch Terminator 2, I think, they don't have engineers that skynet. it. <laughs> now we take that away. Oh, boy. <laughs> is it 2029? <laughs> Whatever it is. Doesn't matter. Right. That's interesting. That's kind of cool. Yeah. And it's, it's incredibly powerful, and it's what our technology is the most well suited for, All right. in my opinion. Yes. Yeah. So time is our friend at this point. As, All right. as, as, as we move into the future, right. our technology becomes more and more relevant. Okay. Very cool. So you mentioned the CAD stuff, and that's one of the things that always, that I always thought, like, that's the roadblock. That's the reason that I don't see a lot of people having stuff like this in their house every day back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can see in the future things will change um, where other businesses get involved in just providing CAD drawings. Yep. But where I have, let's say I got one of these at my house, I want to make a part, I got to scan it, I got to get the file, right. I have to have the program, modify the file to fit, whatever. In all of the learning curve and then all of the understanding yeah. of stresses and mechanics, mm -hmm. that that all goes away with the generative design. Concept. All right. I mean, it doesn't completely go away. I mean, you want somebody that's competent operating the machine, obviously. Right. But it, it massively de-skills uh, manufacturing design. Okay. I picture something more like a Keurig rig coffee mm. machine yeah, not yeah. Now. just yes. slap the thing in there push it i want a cup of coffee right. go yep and then that piece of software will generate the files that go on these printers all right and then you hit print and then you have your part because i imagine autocad is not the cheapest thing in the world yeah. so yep. people aren't going to be paying thousands of dollars a year to print out a coffee mug or yeah. whatever it is they're trying to print yeah but autocad's ahead of you on this one also they have a more consumer oriented product called fusion 360. oh and it and it goes and this goes actually all the way up to, into massive manufacturing okay but they have student versions of it that are very affordable really okay yeah that's super so, cool so for 30 dollars a month you can you can run some of the most expensive most elaborate software in existence wow all right very cool. I'm sorry, you were going to say yeah. something. Yeah, but you, James, today at home with your 3D printer, um, you wouldn't have a scanner, first no. of all, because those are pretty expensive mm -hmm. for a home user. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a website, there are websites with millions of models all already right. made. Okay. Um, those are free, all typically, right. and there are other um, softwares that allow you to modify those models um, that are free. All right. And the software that you need to tell the 3D printer what to do, what to do all right. also can be free. Yeah. So you're getting all of this put all together right. on the internet um, to tell you to tell your 3D printer what to do. So you don't have to know right. um, everything going in, and you're also not going to be able to scan your part. There are companies certainly who can. Okay. Um, but a home user person is not really going to be scanning parts. Got it. Okay. I always thought, man, they could put something on their phone or you just, I don't know, throw it up in the air and take pictures of the right, yeah. or something. Oh, it'll come. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's a technology kind of like that. It's called photogrammetry. And okay. And you take hundreds of photos with your phone mm -hmm. and it'll assemble it into a 3D model. All right. It's kind of clunky. Sure. Give it a couple years. Yeah, okay. Just progress, progress. Yep. Now, I, I get in old cars and I always think of trim pieces and stuff like that. They really don't ha support any weight. Yep. But something like this would be perfect for that. Yeah. Yes. Because you can't find the part. Maybe you have one, but you need two, one for each side or something like that. Yeah, that application is kind of a no-brainer. Okay. And how about a custom shifter knob? Absolutely. No. Yeah, totally. I got a baseball in one of them. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I love manual transmission, so that's awesome. That's super cool. Yeah, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. yeah. All really right. Is. Interesting. Tell me, when people, I imagine people buy this from you, and they get kind of curious, you're probably spending a lot of time on tech support, or it's more just hold my hand support kind of thing. Yep. 
Yep. How do you stop that or prevent that from becoming an issue and more of a time suck for someone that maybe bought a spool or something like that? Well, we do have a user forum. Okay. So that's oh, one. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. That's one tool that we use to help people. Um, well, we, and we have some users who really uh, communicate with each other quite a bit because right. they're working on their projects and trying nice. out new things. All right. Um, but also, we have a very strong philosophy of making sure that you're successful. All right. So we really are going to do what it takes to mm -hmm. make sure that you're successfully printing. Okay. Nice. <clears throat> and, and the other thing we've learned is that people's questions start to more and more fall into very uh, <clears throat> recognizable categories. Mm -hmm. So we just, we just get better at answering the questions. Got it. So, okay. so we're not completely scaling the whole concept of, mm -hmm. of tech support. Okay. Something I want to ask you about warranty stuff, and I think you've more or less answered it. Does anybody print out something? They're like, hey, I printed this engine block. <laughs> not surviving. Well, we something would tell like you not to print an engine block, <laughs> okay. number one. It's um, not one that you want to make run. Right. I mean, we guarantee that you're going to be able to print with the material. Mm -hmm. From there, the things that you make right. are really are going to be your, your responsibility. Gotcha. So when they, you mentioned centering, I think that's what mm -hmm. we call it, right? Yep. yep. So is centering that machine or oven, is that also affordable for a typical home user? Yes. Yes. Yeah, we sell those on our website also. How much? Like, just ballpark. Twenty five hundred. Yeah, twenty five hundred to three thousand. Okay, so not another question. And a lot of people already have these. People that are into making jewelry and glass. Okay. These are even people that do ceramics at home. It's the same equipment. All right. Now, if I remember, oh my gosh, from art class, I'm trying to think how hot did that thing get? There was many hundreds of degrees, but I don't remember how many. Right. It. it for ours, it depends on the on the material. So bronze goes to about 1,700 Fahrenheit. 1,700? Yeah. Oh, that's pretty warm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, but in the realm of kilns, that's relatively low. Yeah, okay. So yeah. on the higher end, when you're dealing with our stainless steels, you need to hit about 2,300 or 2,350. Holy Fahrenheit. cow. Are they electric or are they... Yeah. yeah. Yep. We have examples. There's one sitting right there. I'll, 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 uh, oh, this guy? Okay. Yeah, that's one, but there's a... We'll, I'll, I'll have you take some pictures and All show right. you what that's yeah. about offline. And they can run that off of 110? Yep. And it gets that hot? Yeah. It's wow. Just, it's just a little box that gets hot. I okay. Mean, the, it isn't huge high tech just or anything like that. The it's toaster from hell. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> At that hot, if you put, I mentioned the plastic just vaporizes. Yep. Yeah. That's okay. the idea. Yeah. All right. And can they use those indoors? Yeah. Okay, then I have to vent it or something like that? Yeah, we vent. recommend that people vent it. Okay. But you don't need like a whole ventilation system. It can be a uh, you know, bathroom fan scope type thing. Gotcha. All right. It doesn't need to be large and industrial. It's All right. Everything about what we're doing is to make it very simple and accessible. Mm -hmm. And this applies great for the home users. But it also, we're finding that people in science and in the high-end laboratories like it for exactly the same reason mm -hmm. because they can pick it up and add their own sophistication to it yeah that's cool what are some of the coolest things that you've seen people make with these things hmm we don't know <laughs> okay seriously we, we, right. we, we very little of what's being made with our material we don't know about it all right the things that we do know we can't talk about gotcha so someone at Lockheed from Skunk Works yeah. called you up and just said, thanks. <laughs> That's all I got. Yeah. Um, one of the coolest responses, like when I'm asking probing questions and I'm trying to help a user succeed, mm -hmm. the, the coolest response I've ever gotten is, I can't, you know, I'll ask them questions trying to probe out the problem. Yeah. The coolest answer has been, so far has been, I can't answer that due to national security concerns. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay. Especially <laughs> interesting. Um, one of my favorites is a fellow who works with saxophones. Okay. Because I played saxophone in high school. Oh, nice. A million years ago. All right. Um, so this one's a little near and dear, but he's making pieces out of our copper material for yeah. saxophones. To repair them? Together, yeah. Or he's just building his own? I, probably. probably oh, wow. Is, yes. And he's um, shown me pictures of these, and the pieces are beautiful. Nice. Nice. Um, he hasn't yet sent me a recording okay. of him playing with these installed. All right. Uh, but that's one of my favorite ones because that's uh, pretty because clever. Because I am um, a musician at heart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have some samples here. Can you yes. show us? That looks like sure. a little turbo wheel or turbo turbine, right? 
Is that what I'm looking at there? Yeah, but let's talk about this one. This is a 3D printed moon, um, but it's made out of moon dust simulant filament. Wow. Which is called basalt. So terrestrial basalt. a fake moon. Right. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's clever. Look at all this stuff. So that's a project that people are working on methods of fabricating things on the moon. So obviously, ah. so obviously you need to work with what's there. That's what this Look is. at this. And we've got spiral. Clay. That's clay. Yeah. This is clay. So clay is inside the polymer. Correct. Yeah, right. And that is that's super light. How, who designs this in CAD? Uh, I did. Actually, that's just a really simple program called Tinkercad. Okay. It's another Autodesk product, but it's super easy to use. Wow. I see the little turbo or supercharger yeah, it's a turbine there. Turbine. Okay. Would this be strong enough to actually use? Not presently, no. Okay. And is that because of heat? Or is that. Um, I'm trying uh, to think where the turbo. Actually, all the fundamentals are there. We just need someone to develop it and refine the process to the point where it works. Gotcha. Okay. Interesting. There's a little, I don't know if this guy is a dinosaur yeah. guy. Yeah. That is cool. Is this, is this copper? That's copper. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. This is kind of a fun one. This is trophies. So that's pure copper. And there, wow. there were trophies given out by the 3D printing industry.com awards. Yeah. So those were given to like the very highest end printers that I was talking about, the laser centering printed yeah. that cost a million dollars. Okay. So I have the CEOs of, their, of those companies holding one of my trophies. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> what you paid for your plane ticket, you can do this. That's awesome. That now, is incredible. Check out this one. That's two different materials. It's tungsten on the bottom and copper on the top. Wow. Look at that. Yeah. that this is, is cool. my favorite print. This is 316L. Oh, is that Colossus, yeah. right? Yeah. This I is three sixteen L. So this is uh, is that steel? Stainless steel. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that is cool. Wow. I didn't realize it would be that smooth. Yes. And so this? that had a lot of polish work done to it. When okay. The, when the pieces are finished with the process, they have this more rough, yeah, um, ex looking exterior. Okay. So it it takes a bit of elbow grease to get from that to this nice shiny. Surface. All right. All right. Interesting. Looks yeah, like Brad some right oh, he's got some more. Else. Right. Okay. So, like I said, we keep we ask people to stop and just sort of rethink what they're doing. Yeah. So think of things that you can't fabricate. Holy cow! So that's it's chain. That's chain, chain mail, mail right? made out of solid copper. <laughs> wow. And that's one 3D print. Yeah. So that was printed all together. So it'd be extraordinarily difficult to fabricate in any other way, but it's very easy to 3D print. Wow. That's a whole new world then. It is. Interesting. I'll give you that. I'll mess this one up here. This one's kind of fun. This is a, a nut and bolt. The bolt is universally thrown. Oh, it can turn through. either way? Is that the right. or no? Yeah, you could. The nut is only left-handed. Gotcha. But the same bolt would take a right-handed thread also. Oh my gosh. I just did work on a 40 Plymouth. On either side, they had one side right hand threads for the wheel studs, yeah. <laughs> and the other left hand thread. Right. There was a lot of swearing that happened before I figured that out. <laughs> this would have been much better. You do the opposite of what yeah. you think you should do. Nobody gets that right, putting it back together. Oh my gosh, my brain is lefty, just lefty. Like, what is going on here? <laughs> I think I can see what's supposed to happen here. Oh my gosh. Lefty tidy. Lefty tidy. <laughs> oh, there we go. There you go. Wow. That's pretty cool with the, the hollow or almost hollow there. Mm -hmm. Right. That's crazy. So who designed that? Oh, one of our users. Okay. Is that, I just did, I just unscrewed it just to make myself so I can totally <laughs> check. Oh my gosh. There's a chance. I think he may have gotten it. There's a website called Thingiverse. And okay. It's, and it's a place where people share models. So you can go out there and search and there are How cool is literally that? millions of 3D models. That's that awesome. I, that's probably where this came from. Nice. That's definitely where Colossus came from. That one's a ceramic. That is so surreal that you have so many different materials yeah. that you can print. <coughs> that is bizarre. And the workflow for the, on the manufacturing side is the same. I mean, they're all the same thing. Yeah. It isn't important to us that there are different materials. Right. Interesting. That's pretty clever. Where can people find you online? 
TheVirtualFoundry.com. TheVirtualFoundry.com. Yes. Awesome. That's easy enough. Yep. Awesome. And they can reach us at info at TheVirtualFoundry.com. Cool. Cool. Well, thank you so much. Trisha, Brand, thank you so much for being on the show. This is cool. Yeah, thanks for having us. We think it's pretty cool. We're always happy to tell others about it. I am, you know, I was impressed when I was talking to you before. I'm even more impressed now. I had no idea that there was this much going on. So that's cool. So when I come here in a couple of years, where do you expect things to be? Mm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. So I, I guess yeah, I, we don't even know how to answer that. I it just, right. It, it, the industry that it's we're advancing. in changes so quickly, yeah. and the business changes quickly. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's going to be fantastic to see what happens. And nice. We're, we're also what Trisha describes us as industry agnostic. So we're getting traction in you know, everything from aerospace to autos to, to whatever you can think of. Mm -hmm. So my expectation is maybe we start growing in one of those directions or spin off yeah. something specific for one of those particular industries. All right. But presently, it's the same technology for every user. Gotcha. And it works for everyone in the same way for the same reason. That's cool. I like it. All kinds of fun. You heard it here, right? <laughs> cool. This has been Authentic Business Adventures, the business program that brings you the struggle stories and triumph and successes of business owners across the land. Past episodes, of course, can be found morning, noon, and night. The podcast link found at drawincustomers.com. We're underwritten locally by the Bank of Sun Prairie. If you're listening to this on the web or watching it, of course, please subscribe, share, comment, and of course, visit the, remind me your website? TheVirtualFoundry.com. TheVirtualFoundry.com. This is amazing. Yeah. I'm excited. I keep thinking, like, what should we build? <laughs> right. It's time to take over the world. My name is James Kademan, and Authentic Business Adventures is brought to you by Calls on Call. Offering call answering and receptionist services for service businesses across the country on the web at callsoncall.com, as well as Draw in Customers Business Coaching, offering business coaching services for entrepreneurs looking for growth on the web at drawincustomers.com. And of course, the Bold Business Book, a book for the entrepreneur and all of us, available wherever fine books are sold. We'd like to thank you, our wonderful listeners, as well as our guests. We have Trisha, the president of Virtual Foundry, as well as Brad, the founder. Visit them at thevirtualfoundry.com. Thank you guys for being on the show. This is super cool. Yeah, thanks Thank for having us. I'm impressed. People got to go out there and build some stuff, right? <laughs> right. It makes this country great. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. I want you to stay awesome. If you do nothing else, enjoy your business. <laughs>